I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Each and every spring, the black cutworm makes a migration northward into the state of Illinois, other parts of the Midwest. And it's oftentimes looking for weedy fields in which it can lay its eggs. Mike Gray, Extension entomologist from the U of I, is with us to take up the black cutworm and the migration and what farmers should be looking for and what kinds of problems are created with the weeds. Hi, Mike. Thanks for being with us. Well, my pleasure, Todd. Uh, you know, the black cutworm is often considered by many entomologists as one of the most significant uh, insect pests of corn on a year-by-year -year basis. And in fact, at, at one time, certainly before BT uh, made its presence you know, known many years ago back in the mid-90s, it was considered as kind of one of the three key insect pests of corn. And historically, producers were probably much more in tune with what this insect looks like, how it damages plants, how to scout for it, you know, what rescue treatments might be appropriate than many producers are currently. Th to some uh, extent, we probably rely too much on BT hybrids, and, and not all BT hybrids are going to provide the necessary protection uh, that some producers may think uh, they will for this particular insect. This year has been very different than last year. Many of us will remember the record-breaking temperatures in March of 2012, and uh, this year stands in stark contrast to that. We all know we're off to a very late start uh, this spring. We've had a lot of storms move through the state, and along with those storms uh, from the south and southwest, we know that black cutworm moths are migrating into the Midwest in many areas in pretty significant numbers. The field behind me uh, is a good example of the type of field these black cutworm moths are looking for. What kinds of things can producers do to predict where the black cutworm might be? Um, how it's migrated into their areas? Where do they get information? Well, when we look at the black cutworm, some good uh, spots for information, of course, would include uh, any of our uh, land-grant uh, websites. Uh, uh, certainly, I would hope uh, producers in Illinois would look at our Pest Management and Crop Development Bulletin for, for updates on the black cutworm and its movement into the state. But again, uh, I, I would urge producers to consider monitoring for black cutworms. And if they're not willing to monitor for, for the black cutworm moth, certainly to know where to tune into information. So again, this pest management and crop development bulletin is a good, is a good starting point. You know, the black cutworm, um, unlike some other insect pests, uh, uh, they don't spend the winter here in the state. They are migratory. And this wasn't very well understood for many years. In fact, it was kind of a mystery in terms of where black cutworms spend the winter. And back in the 1980s, a graduate student at Iowa State University published some research that identified some pollen on the scales of black cutworm moths. And these pollen grains were unique to plants that occur far to our south uh, in states like Texas or even further south into Mexico. So these are, these are uh, moths, uh, they are strong migratory moths. They're certainly assisted by these strong southerly winds uh, on storm fronts, but they come in to our state and other Midwestern areas looking for fields uh, such as this one uh, behind us. And these are fields in which the black cutworm females will begin to lay their eggs on these uh, weedy plants. What does that moth look like? Well, the black cutworm moth, uh, it's a pretty large moth. Uh, if you look at the forewings or the front wings, there are some very distinguishing marks on each of those forewings. Uh, there is a striking black dagger on each of those forewings that's readily apparent. So they're relatively easy moth uh, to identify. And again, um, we can use pheromone traps uh, to monitor the, the spring migration. Uh, the traps uh, contain a little rubber septum that emits the female sex attractant, and so only the males are going to typically be caught on the sticky bottoms uh, of these traps. And again, the males are looking for females to mate with, and following mating, uh, these females are going to lay their eggs on typically winter annual weeds, or in some cases, if those weeds aren't present, 
They will even lay their eggs on residue out in fields. Uh, soybean residue is preferred uh, over corn residue, but any kind of fine textured, textured residue is a good spot for these black cutworm females uh, to lay their eggs. And as we know, planting is going to be delayed this year. And the closer planting is tied to weed management, uh, the greater the potential is uh, for uh, cutworm injury. Why is that the case? The black cutworms, uh, again, once the, once the uh, uh, larvae hatch from eggs, uh, initially they will begin to feed on these weeds. But as weeds are destroyed either through tillage or herbicides, and as corn seedlings begin to emerge, these black cutworm larvae will move off their weed hosts onto these young developing corn plants. Corn plants at the four leaf stage or below are most susceptible to cutting. And initially producers who are scouting should look for small pinholes that are removed out of leaf tissue. That's kind of an early signal that future cutting may take place. At about the six leaf stage of development, uh, the growing points of corn plants begin to come above the soil surface. And if the cut is made below that growing point, obviously that plant uh, will, not, will not recover. So this is an insect, the larvae, that reduces stand. Um, the historic threshold was a 3% uh, cutting level. And again, that uh, economic uh, threshold certainly would vary depending upon you know, the price of corn, I would be a little bit more conservative with that 3% uh, cutting uh, threshold. You're talking about a threshold that would be when a corn plant is in the field and up and growing. At the same time, you're telling producers that they should be putting a pheromone trap out in the field. What are they gonna use the pheromone trap for? The pheromone trap uh, basically uh, is used to again, capture the, the moss. And when we have what is known as a biofix, which would be when you capture nine or more moths over a one or two day period, at that point, we can begin to accumulate uh, heat units, uh, growing degree days, uh, as they're often referred to, using a base 50 degree Fahrenheit as our threshold. When we accumulate about 300 heat units, that's a good point at which cutting may begin to take place. So when we see about 300 heat units past that biofix, uh, those larvae are probably uh, at the cutting stage, which would be the, about the fourth larval instar. That's a critical point when producers, and hopefully they're gonna get out there even before then, but that's at a point when cutting may begin to occur in those fields.